Well, good morning, everybody. Today we're gonna uh, be studying Matthew chapter seven, and this is a really famous passage of scripture. It's probably most well known by unbelievers, and probably the verse that we hear from unbelievers the most. And uh, you know, of course, it's judge not that ye be not judged. And this whole passage has to do with judging others. Um, but really, I've, I've had it kind of mixed up over the years as a believer. And uh, I think it's a passage that's uh, worth taking a look at. So let's start with prayer and then we'll dig into the text. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you've revealed yourself to us through it and that it's the perfect word of God. And Father, that you've given us uh, a way to live and instructions for life, doctrine, that we can walk in fellowship with you and, and experience all the blessings that you have for us along the narrow path that leads to life. And we pray, Father, that your spirit would be with us now and that you'd give us understanding and that through the preaching and teaching of the word, you'd mold us into the image of Christ. All this we pray in his name. Amen. So, okay, so it says, Judge not that ye be not judged. Well, the first thing that we have to note is that any time you start trying to preach the gospel or talk about Jesus or anything about the Bible to unbelievers, you're going to hear this. They're going to say, judge not, that you be not judged. And, you know, some people will even refer to it as the 11th commandment. <laughs> you know, because it's the one commandment that all the unbelievers know. And it, you run the risk anytime you're, you know, preaching to someone that's an unbeliever, you run the risk of looking as though you're passing judgment on them and, and doing these types of things. And a lot, it's, it's just kind of par for the course. It comes with the territory. If you're going to be a believer and if you're going to preach to people, some of the times people are going to say you're judging them and all this and that, and you're going to hear it. Um, and it is kind of funny to watch unbelievers try to quote this. Doesn't the Bible say, you know, something about judging? <laughs> Where does it say that? In the Ten Commandments. Oh, that's the Ten Commandments too. You know, and you get some funny remarks. But in any event, there it is. Judge not that you be not judged. So people would say, well, this means then that you shouldn't be judging people. Well, is that necessarily true? Well, in John chapter 7 and verse 24, it says, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Judge righteous judgment. So the thing that we have to be aware of here in this context is that it's talking about hypocritical judgment. I mean, it's not to say that it's wrong to judge. There's an entire book in the Bible called Judges, right? So there's plenty of judging. We're going to have to judge. But what the error is, is hypocritical or unrighteous judgment. So that's what we're seeing in this, in this context here. So it says, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Um, this word here, when we're looking at judgment, is uh, crino. I'll switch over now to the King James with the, the Strong's links. And you see, judge not is crino. You see, that means to distinguish. That is decide mentally or judicially. By implication, to try, condemn, or punish. So to try, condemn, or punish. Um, and if we turn over to uh, John chapter 7 and verse 24, which I mentioned earlier which talks about judging righteous judgment, we'll see that uh, that word righteous judgment, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. It says dikaios, dikaios, uh, equitable, holy, just, right, dikaios, equitable, just, holy, and right. That's the type of judgment that we're supposed to execute. So we'll go back over here to Matthew chapter 7. Verse 
For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. So here when we're talking about you know, judging your brother, and it's again, it's talking about hypocritical judgment. Um, and what we're seeing here is, you know, looking at your brother, examining your brother, and he's got a moat in his eye. Let, let's take a quick peek at that word moat. Carphos, a dry twig or a straw. So we're talking about a little twig in someone's eye. Why are you examining and pointing out this flaw that your brother has, which is this tiny little twig, this little straw that he's got in his eye, when you've got a beam? Let's look at that word beam. It's dokos or dokos, a stick of timber, a beam. So you've got a beam in your eye. And what is it exactly that the Bible says? Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. We'll, we'll get to that verse. Prove yourselves. We'll take a look at that. Not examine your brother. But what this is, is, you know, it comes down to our understanding of people and our, our understanding even of ourself and of the human race in general. So let's turn over to Luke chapter 18. I like this passage a lot. Uh, Luke chapter 18, and I'm going to begin in verse 9. I'm going to switch it back over to the King James without the Strong's links uh, to make it a little bit easier to read. And so this is the passage that the heading is, The Pharisee and the Tax Collector. So it says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. So the publican is a tax collector. And tax collectors were really despised. At this point in time in Israel, they were kind of despised. And a lot of them were dishonest. They'd uh, uh, extort people and they'd, they'd charge them extra and they'd get away with it and stuff. So this was really someone that was oftentimes looked down upon, a, a publican or a tax collector. It says, so the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. So you see here that the Pharisee, the religious leader of the day, he's going, Lord, I thank you that I'm not this wicked man just full of sin. You've cleansed me. I'm good now. Thank you, Lord, that you've made me so righteous and so upright before you. I thank you that I'm not like everyone else in the world. I'm better than them. I'm not a sinner. I'm a saint. Right? That's what the Pharisee is saying. He goes on, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So the question becomes, when we're passing judgment, because you do have to judge, right? Are you judging hypocritically? Are you holding people to a standard that you would fail to meet? Oh, I've found some sin in this guy's life. He's committed an error over here. I need to judge him. Judge righteous judgment according to the law of God. Well, I mean, what about me? Have I made a mistake in the past? Do I have any in my, in my life right now? Maybe that I'm not even aware of. And will I make one in the future? Because remember, the standard that I hold everyone else to, that's going to be used against me. So do I want to be this unforgiving, hard man that's just feared, holding people to this really high standard and thinking of myself, I'm upright, I have no sin. I tell you, this man, talking about the publican, who smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified 
rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So are we aware of our own faults? Look what it says over here in James chapter 5. This is another one of the problems that you run into in the world of Christianity. Uh, you know, when talking about righteous and unrighteous judgment. You know, people passing judgment. And in judgment, what we're talking about here is really not so much just a judgment that we make in the mind. It's a condemnation, right? It's when we're judging someone and condemning them and passing a sentence upon them saying that they're guilty and unworthy. When we're doing this to people, right, when perhaps we also fall short of the mark. There's so many out there that if you were to say to them, confess your faults one to another. If I were to tell you all right now, as the sermon goes on this morning, get a blank piece of paper in your notebook and start making a list of your faults, okay? And just continue working on it. How many are you gonna come up with by the end of the hour? Or let's just, let's just put no end on it, right? Let's just say, let's work on this list for the next week, right? A list of our faults. Can you come up with faults? Because James here in, verse, in chapter 5, verse 15, 16 says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So the Pharisee, he examines himself, and what does he say? Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like everyone else. I'm not out there extorting people and lying to people. I fast and I give tithes and look at all my great works. You've cleaned me up, Lord. I'm not a sinner. I'm a saint. Right? And you tell him, start making this list of all your faults. Because the Bible says, confess your faults one to another. And he comes up short, doesn't he? How many faults <laughs> you think he gets? Probably zero, right? I could, I could start telling you about my faults. You know how I have a tendency when I come home from work and I see that the kids have made a mess of the house? You think I can be impatient with them? You think I can be intolerant of my children and say, hey guys, what are you doing? Why'd you destroy the house again? And start yelling? You think I can lose my temper when I come home to a dirty house? Of course I can, but guess what? How many kids are there in the world today that haven't made a mess, right? That didn't pick up their clothes off the floor. How many times did I do that when I was a kid, yeah. right? Yeah. So when you understand the nature of children, you know, should I lose my temper when I come home and, and there's a mess? No, I shouldn't. I've done it. I've lost my temper when I've come home and seen, you know, come home from a hard day's work too, right? A stressful day of work and you come home to something like that. I can be impatient with my kids and hold them to a standard of perfection to where they can't make a mess. And if they make a mess, it's gonna upset me. But do I have the right to be upset? I'm not supposed to be getting upset. I'm not supposed to be getting angry because I'm supposed to be understanding that God's in control of everything. And I'm supposed to be patient with people even my own family, even, even everyone. It applies to everyone. I'm not supposed to be easily irritated. When I'm easily irritated, it's because I'm upset with what, everything that God has decreed in the world. So my number one fault would be my impatience. When things aren't going the way that I want them, I want it changed now. So I have to work on that. And I've got others as well. You know, I can hold, I, like I said, I can hold my kids and myself to a standard that's, that's really high. I got perfectionist. And you know what that is? Pride. Oh, we have to be perfect. That's like the Pharisee, right? That's pretty much being like the Pharisee. Oh, we got to be good. We got to have no errors at all. Well, guess what? That's against human nature. And so that pride spills over into sensitivity. And if someone wants to criticize me, I can, I can throw my hands up in the air and say, well, 
How, how, how dare you? How can you say these things about me? And I can be easily offended. And so what is that other than just a elevated self-esteem? How dare this person offend me? How dare he treat me like this? Do you know who I am? <laughs> Right? That's essentially what we're saying when we get offended because someone else mistreats us. You can't treat me like that. Well, why not? Why, why, what makes me so good? Am I that good? The key to understanding all these things is understanding the sovereignty of God. That God's in control of everything. Right? And not only that, not only that God is in control of everything, and that I'm to accept everything in the world around me. It's not just that, but it's also to accept the truth about myself, right? And what's the truth about myself? That if God gave me what I deserved right now, he'd strike me dead with a lightning bolt for all my sin. And yes, he's granted me repentance. And yes, I'm a changed man. But just stop and think for a second about all the sin that I've been forgiven of before I came to Christ. And guess what? There's been sin afterwards too. Right? Because it's a long process. We're talking about the sanctification process in which He makes us holier and holier and holier as we go through life. And it's not always fun. He burns off our sin. We're gold. He puts us in the, in the furnace and burns off all of our impurifications, all of our impurities in the course of time. And sometimes that fire burns, but this is part of it. At what point do we get to the point where we no longer have these impurities, these imperfections, and we no longer need the fire? Well, you know what? I've yet to meet that man. I have everyone I've met in the world, and I've been on multiple continents, I've been in multiple countries. I've been in multiple churches. I've been, I've been around the world. I've lived here for a while. I've yet to meet the man that's just so holy that he just levitates around, floating in the air. Just comes in and he's so holy that he just doesn't ever sin. It's part of our makeup. It's part of our humanity. And so we have to keep it in mind. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. So pray for me that I'll be more patient. You want to practice patience? I mean, if you, if you're, if you view yourself as a patient man, here's the test. Next time you go to work, get in the right lane on the highway and stay in the right lane the entire way. That, there's the test of patience. And do that for the next six months. I drive in the slow lane on the highway. Yeah. That's patience, right? That's going at a slow rate, not being in a rush, not being worried about things, just taking it easy. Yeah. Let's turn back over to uh, Matthew 7. So the context of this passage here is hypocritical, unrighteous judgment. How wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite. Let's, uh, let's take a look at this verse. I'm going to switch over again to the King James with the Strong's links so that we can see this word. Hypocrite. Hupocrites. Can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. The bottom right or bottom left. Um, Hupocrites, an actor under an assumed character, a stage player. So this is an actor in the theater. That's what a hypocrite is. That's what it, that's what it means in the Greek, hypocrites. It's, it's an actor. And it comes from huko, uh, hupo, meaning under, and krino, which is judge. So some people will look at that hupo, meaning under, and in place of under, it can be defined as inferior, under in rank or inferior, under inferior judge. So a hypocrite is an inferior judge 
and he's an actor in a play on a stage in the theater pretending he's a pretender he's pretending to be someone else so the inferior judge the hypocrite goes around judging everyone else pretending like he's not guilty of sin Right? And holding this high standard of perfection that everyone around him must meet. It's not biblical. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. We'll keep it in the King James with the Strong's links. And we'll take a look at some of these underlying Greek words here. So it says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. This word prove, now notice first before we start defining words here, does it say examine Rose whether she be in the faith? It's gone, examine Rose whether she be in the faith. Hmm. Let's say examine your brother, see whether or not he's in the faith. Doesn't say that, does it? If we'd all just take a minute to step back and say, you know what, if I examine myself, there's probably enough stuff there to keep me busy for a while, and I don't necessarily need to condemn everyone around me. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Prove is dokimazo. <laughs> Prove means to test. Prove or try. This word dokimazo, this is the Strong's definition that we're looking at right now. Um, if I put it in the Thers, it'll tell you that it actually refers to the testing of metals. And so they would test metals for purity. How? With heat. So it's the testing of metals through heat. That's what this proving is. That's how you would prove that a metal is pure. Uh, so prove your own selves, examine and try and test yourselves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So it's funny because uh, we're to test and try and examine our own selves, aren't we? To see if we're actually living as Christians and we're to know ourselves, it says in the second part of the verse. Know yourselves as well. What are your faults? Because if we're unaware of our faults, if I'm unaware that I'm impatient, and for a while there I was. For a while there I thought it was my duty. My kids needed to obey and it was not right for them to have, you know, made a mess of their room. And it's my job as their father to correct them. And I'm going to be strict and I'm going to apply this law to them. Well, guess what? That's an incorrect judgment. That's an unjust judgment. Because when we study the scriptures, we see that God is not just holding us to this ridiculously high standard of law. He's merciful to us. And He's gracious to us. These are the overwhelming characteristics that He's displayed to us, to His children. He's adopted us into His family as children. And He loves us, and He's filled us with His Holy Spirit. And He's given us rules for living. He's given us a, a, a purpose for life and a mission. And all of these things are examples of His benevolence towards us. Sometimes people get this skewed view of God that He's up there in heaven and He just wants, just wants to kill you. And he's out to get you, and he's this malevolent God that's here to destroy you. And in your own strength and by your own might, you've got to live this perfect life. It doesn't work that way. Anything good that I have, I've got by the grace of God. He fills me with his spirit, and he enables me to walk by his grace in this narrow path that leads to life. It's funny, too, because... We need to know these, these faults that we have so that we can overcome them. You know, if we're unaware of them, we can't overcome them. If, when I wasn't aware that I was being impatient with my kids and with other people too, because, uh, you know, when I'm at work and I have employees that work for me, 
I can hold them to this really high standard, you know? And I can be impatient with them as well. And unappreciative of the effort that they're putting in. So if I'm unaware that I'm being that way, then it makes it hard to correct, right? So we really do need to examine ourselves so that we can pray to God and pray for one another, that He continues working in us so that we can overcome these faults, so that we can have victory over the sin in our life. Like James says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You can have victory over sin in this life. We're never going to get there to where we're perfect. We're never going to get there to where we don't have sin. As long as we're in this flesh. Listen, every morning I wake up and who wakes up with me? That old man. That old man every single day. And if I don't crucify him, if I don't reach out and strangle him, and put him to death, he's going to ruin my life. If we enter, re enter into rest, we enter into the Sabbath daily. We have a daily Sabbath. Christ is our Sabbath. We trust and believe in Christ. We trust and believe that he's got control of everything that's happening in the world. And then it's all working together for our good, the good of believers. So therefore we have peace and we can rest and we don't have to worry about what we're going to eat for food and how we're going to clothe ourselves and how we're going to pay the bills and everything else. We can trust in God. We can't have victory over sin in our lives by trusting in God and through prayer and going to Him with our problems. Let's go back over again to uh, Matthew 7, talking about hypocritical, unrighteous judgment. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. This is interesting. The next verse, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. So it's interesting because it starts off talking about judge not that ye be not judged. And then the world will come and say, judge not that you be not judged. It's the Ten Commandments. <laughs> you know, and they'll start saying all these things. And you get, you know, it can be funny, the things that they say. But in any event, this is like the one verse that they know is in the Bible. They don't know where it is. They don't know it's Matthew 7, 1. <laughs> they know it's there somewhere. Well, where does it say that? It says it there somewhere. You know. But then, in the end of the passage, it says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before the swine. So who's the dogs and the swine? It's talking about them. Unbelievers. It's talking about the world. Okay, so in that sense, Jesus is saying you must make a judgment in your mind about who the believers are and who the unbelievers. Is this person hostile towards God? If I go out and preach the gospel, does this person get angry and start yelling, judge not, and every, you know, and everything else? Well, what Jesus says is, don't cast your pearls before swine and don't give that which is holy unto the dogs. What's he saying? He's saying, they're not, don't expect the world to act like believers. Don't expect the world to act like Christians. Don't expect the world to live these lives for others. They're going to be selfish. They're going to live for the flesh, for what feels good. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So don't go around, you know, uh, preaching all these things in the world to people that, you know, they're just, they don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. Which is why when we go out into, into the public and preach to people, we preach forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin. And we preach the gospel. We preach the name of Jesus Christ. And that name alone, because so many people understand what that name means, the name of Jesus, they understand that it means repentance. They understand that it means the narrow path. They understand that it means holy living. They get angry because they want to continue in sin. They want to continue serving the almighty dollar and rejecting God. They know when they're doing it. They know when they're rejecting God and living for self, when they're in a uh, 
sexual relationship outside of marriage and the guy's living with the girl, you know, and they're not married and they, they, they're saving money on rent, so they're going to continue this way and you know, don't go to church and yeah, going out to the bars and doing drugs and doing all these things. And people know when they're off in sin. And so when you tell people about Christ, there's power in that name. There's enough power in that name to make people very, very, very upset. So give not that which is holy unto the dogs. So don't expect them, you know, to be interested in prophecy when they're, they're not even interested in receiving forgiveness for their sin. Okay? Um, let's just continue reading here. Along in Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to switch it back to the King James to make it a little bit easier on the eyes here on the screen. We have a good day for the screen today because it's uh, gray skies outside. When there's a lot of light coming in through the window, it makes it hard to see here on the, the screen from the projector. But when it's dark outside, we can see pretty good. But uh, you just never know how it's going to go. Here in Tennessee, the weather's been crazy lately. Yesterday, I was doing some cleaning. It's New Year's Day, January 1st, and I had to shut the heat off, or the heat off in the house and it was still 76 degrees inside. <laughs> Cleaning the house in a tank top, just sweating, dying in there. I almost had to turn on the AC in January. Now today it's temperatures dropped a little, but it's still, still gray skies and a lot of rain. But uh, we'll continue along here in Matthew 7 and verse 7. It says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So just kind of keep in mind that he just got through, this is Jesus speaking, and he just got through talking all about hypocritical judgment. Okay? And then he goes on and says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? Whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil... <laughs> Look what Jesus says. He says, you guys think you're good? You guys think that you're so holy that you're, you're going to be like that Pharisee who just says, thank you that I'm not like everyone else. Jesus says, if you're evil, and you are, and you know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them which ask him? Right? We know how to give good gifts. To, if my son comes to me and says, Dad, can, I'm hungry. Can I have a piece of that salmon that you've grilled? No, you get this snake. <laughs> you're, not, you're not worthy of this fine piece of trout. <laughs> Oh, man. If I'm going to take care of my own family, isn't God going to take care of us? So this is, again, when he's talking about, he goes on, he's talking about hypocritical judgment, and he's talking about that removing that beam out of your own eyes so that you can see clearly. And then he goes on to talk about the goodness of God. Well, who are we supposed to imitate? Who are we supposed to be like? Are we supposed to be Christ-like? Is God this malevolent God that wants to destroy us and wants to kill us? Or has he adopted us into his family as his children? Has he showered his love upon us? Has he filled us with his Holy Spirit and given the Holy Spirit of promise and promised eternal life to us? This is what I see when I read the Bible. I see a gracious and a merciful God. To all those that believe in him. And so he's talking about the goodness of God. And essentially telling us to go out and emulate that example. Because in the next verse he says, Therefore, now this is the golden rule. You see the, the heading here. The golden rule. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is 
the law and the prophets. So basically, the teaching is the way that you'd like to be treated, that's how you should be treating other people. The way that you want others to act, why don't you act that way? When I make a mistake, do I want people to condemn me harshly and cut me down with sharp words? Does that feel good? Or do I want them to be merciful to me? Do I want them to be understanding and patient and tolerant with me? Well, I would prefer that they're tolerant with me. And do you know what I found? Do you know what I found? That when I used to fly off the handle at my kids because they messed up their room, they're in the basement in my house. We have a split level ranch. And so when you come in the front door, my kids, have, my girls anyways, have the downstairs. And so I'll sometimes come home over the door, look down there, ah! <laughs> close on the stairs. You know? <laughs> oh boy. But what I found is that when I see that it's messy or that I come home and they haven't done their chores, Right? or something like that I found that when I start yelling at them they don't respond well you know but when I go to them kindly and say hey guys we could really use some help around here with the chores I know it's a little bit past the time that it's supposed to be done you think you can help me and get them done they respond much 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 better you know with a soft answer and understanding and patience and like I said why am I gonna hold my kids and my family to a standard of perfection. I've done that in the past. So treat others the way that you'd like to be treated. Ah, you know what? I wanted to turn over talking about the ask and it will be given. Um, there's actually exposition on those verses here if ye then being evil know how to good give good gifts unto your children how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good gifts or give good give good things to them that ask him there's exposition on this in James chapter 4 James chapter 4 uh, uh, in James a lot of times he's clarifying what Jesus has said so when we get over here to James chapter 4 and verse 1 James says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So this is talking about, you know, us living for the flesh. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war. And you don't have anything. Because you're not even going to God to ask for these things. Ye have not because ye ask amiss. You're not asking for the right things. You're not asking according to the will of God. So when I go to God in prayer, Jesus just got through telling us over there in Matthew chapter seven that God's our good father. He's gonna give bestow gifts upon us better than we give to our own children. But what are these gifts that he's gonna, is, you know, is he gonna give me the mansion on the lake? Is he gonna give me that vacation home down in Florida that I've always wanted? You know, a yacht and all this, a private jet and all these riches and material possessions? No, that's not what we're going to get in the narrow path that leads to life. It's not about that. It's about living for others, right? Not being selfish, denying self, denying the lusts and desires of this corrupt flesh, the sin nature and the old man that we have in living for God, in helping others. That's what we do in this life. We're here to lift others up. We humble ourselves and we lift up others. That's edifying. That's building up the body of Christ. We're not here to cut them down or anything like that. And that's what I think when I see all these words. Ye, ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war. 
These are all the things that we're not supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be seeking God to help us internally. Help us have victory over sin in our lives. Help us to, to remove that ungodly pride that exists in all of us. Help us to display the characteristics of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit to the world around us. This is my daily prayer. We can even continue reading here if I skip up to uh, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. James chapter 4 and verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, more on judging, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? So it's a little bit, uh, it's not exactly clear what's going on in this context of James chapter 4, 10 through, 11, 10 through 12, particularly verse 11. Uh, most of your commentators will suggest that this is talking about some type of disputing over the law, uh, whether they were going to continue with some of the Jewish traditions or not. So that's when it says, he that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his, his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. So may, maybe, you know, if this guy's at the moment continuing in some of the Jewish traditions of the law, you know, don't speak evil of the law. Jews continued doing those traditions while they were in Israel because it was a part of national Israel's law. So if there was a Christian living in Israel after the crucifixion of Christ, he was obligated by law, the law of the land, to continue in those religious traditions, okay, of the law. The, there was a, 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 what you'd call a church and state in ancient Israel were merged. Okay, so there's that. But the, but the context here is talking about judging. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? So when it's talking about this, it's talking about condemning. It's talking about condemning someone else. So we need to be really careful before we condemn someone else. It's okay to make a judgment. We're supposed to judge righteous judgment. And sometimes we have to form conclusions on certain matters. And certainly there are, there are examples of, of times when uh, church discipline needs to be executed and when someone has gone astray and needs correction. Certainly there's that time. But... Um, you know, the thing is, is that we, when, we, when we are going to study judging and, and these types of things, we need to see what the overall teaching of Scripture in its totality says. And what are the characteristics that we're supposed to be showing on a daily basis? Are we supposed to be these hard-hearted, uh, hard hard-headed people that demand perfection from everyone around us? Look what it says over here in Ephesians 4. We looked at this last week. We're going to look at it again right now. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And in the latter uh, part of this chapter, it's talking about the new life. I'm just going to skip up to verse 30. And it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. We should write that down and put it on the wall in our house, right? And look at it every day. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. I like to read the commentaries on this verse because it says we should never do it about anyone ever. It's never acceptable. Don't go around talking bad, speaking ill of brothers in Christ, of sisters in Christ, or of people in the world behind their back or any other way. 
What, is it, what benefit is that going to serve? Why would you do that? Why are you cutting people down and talking about them and condemning them? That's ungodly. That's not Christian behavior. Let all bitterness and wrath. When you have these feelings of resentment in your heart, you need to root them out. If we were to back up a little bit in the same chapter, right? Uh, here in verse 26, it says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So when you get angry, you need to get that thing out of your heart in the same day. Don't let the sun go down because that anger will boil over into resentment. And now you're holding a grudge. And guess what happens when you hold a grudge? No one's going to want to be around you. You're not going to be of use to anyone. You're not going to be able to help anyone when you're full of anger and rage and wrath and resentment. And be ye kind to one another. So now this is the way that we are supposed to act. Be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So we're going to put this one here in the uh, King James with the Strong's links. Uh, forgiving one another. That's the word, charizomai. To grant as a favor, that is, gratuitously, in kindness, pardon or rescue, deliver, forgive, give, grant. So this word forgiving, charizomai, it's a derivative of the Greek word charis. It's regularly translated as gave or forgive. Charis means grace. Be gracious to one another. Be gracious in forgiving merciful right it's kind of synonymous with merciful not holding grudges against people look what it says over here in romans chapter 5 i love this how are we to forgive others even as god for christ's sake hath forgiven you that way the same way that god forgave me that's how i'm supposed to forgive others but i was dead in trespasses and sins i was in a jail cell when I received the forgiveness of God in my life, the, when the grace of God came into my life, I was in a jail cell. I wasn't searching for God. He came to me. And he planted faith in my heart, and he gave me repentance. It's the gift of God. I didn't do anything to deserve it. But he was merciful to me, and he was gracious to me. That word grace, charis, means unmerited favor. It was something I didn't deserve. It was something I didn't earn. Romans 5. I love this. We're going to put it back in King James. Verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace, and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Free gift. The free gift. The free gift of forgiveness and redemption in salvation that God gave to us through Jesus when we didn't deserve it. Sometimes people will say that, you know, in order to forgive someone, they have to be repentant. If someone doesn't repent, you can't forgive them. Well, listen, there's problems with that. There's problems with that because you can't hold resentment in your heart. You can't hold anger in your heart, which is why I like what the commentaries on Ephesians chapter four in verse 30 have to say when it says over here um, 
And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. When you read John Gill and some of the others, they'll say, listen, if someone is off in sin and, you know, you can't have fellowship with him, that's one thing. But if he's done something wrong and he's sinned and he's sinned against God and he's violated God's law and he's in error, we need to forgive him in our heart anyways. So that when he turns and comes to us, we've already forgiven him. We, maybe the fellowship has been disrupted. And as a good brother in Christ, we can't, we can't say, what you're doing is okay, brother. That's fine. If you want to live with your girlfriend, that's fine. You know, we need to warn our brother when he's in sin and when he's in trouble. But harboring resentment and holding a grudge toward him is, towards him is 100% wrong always. We're not allowed to hold on to the, that type of anger in our heart. It's ungodly. It's bitterness. Right there, it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger uh, be put away from you. And, uh, and look what it says over here in Romans 12. These are teachings that we just encounter over and over and over again. We're talking about the characteristics of Christ now and the fruit of the Spirit. This was part of the reason why I like to preach right through books of the Bible. I like, we just finished a study on Galatians because as you go through Galatians, he's talking about crucifying the old man. And, and walking in the Spirit and showing what the fruit of the Spirit is, right? And so as we preach through the books of the Bible, we see these things over and over again. And Paul's explaining these things for a particular reason. And we, so we should read, right, in context. Um, and so in Romans 12 and verse 17, it says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You know what that means right there? If someone does something wrong to you, you don't have to get mad. You don't have, you're not obligated to get mad and hold people to a standard of perfection. He that loves the law is not easily offended, right? We can be spiritually mature and say, you know what? He mistreated me. I've mistreated others. And I'll probably do it again. And God's been merciful to me. I'm doing far better than my iniquities deserve. So you know what? God's in control of this man's actions anyways. He's under, he also falls under the category of the sovereignty of God. So this man's not persecuting me. This is the work of God. And I have to accept it, right? And be content, no matter what state I find myself in. So I don't have to get mad at him. And that's the trick. We're not supposed to. We're supposed to accept it. And even when we're being persecuted, we're supposed to rejoice. God's purifying us. And all things are working together for our good. So we don't need to be easily offended. We don't need to have this attitude of, how dare you? Do that to me. Don't you know who I am? <laughs> who am I? Who on earth am I but a worm? <sighs> Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Don't seek vengeance. Don't go trying to repay someone. If they do something bad to you, if they're full of wrath and anger, give place and let them be full of wrath. You remove yourself. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. How about you let God be the judge? How about we don't get involved? How about we make the judgment in our head, but refrain from condemning the person? Because when we condemn the person, that's when we become God. That's when I elevate myself to a position that I do not have, that I'm not entitled to. God is the judge. Therefore, Let's not skip these verses, right? Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. People are going to wrong you. People are going to do things. They're going to sin. 
Okay, it all goes back to our understanding of ourselves and others and of the entire human race. Are you the Pharisee or the publican? The publican smote his breast and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. But the Pharisee looks up to heaven and says, I thank you that I'm not like everyone else. I fast. I give tithes. I'm great. I'm better than everyone. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like all these unjust sinners. Not so much, right? How about Matthew 18? We'll finish with Matthew 18. And uh, ah, I'm going to start with Matthew 5 for one last passage from directly from the mouth of Jesus on the same issues before we get to Matthew 18, and then we'll close there. So in Matthew 5 and verse 38, talking about retaliation, you have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, in a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with them twain. And give him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the just. Do you know what that verse there is saying? Matthew 5, 45? Don't get mad at your enemy, this man that you perceive to be your enemy, okay? Because God's pouring the rain out on the just, and the unjust. This is talking about the providence of God. Okay? He's in control of all things. He wants that guy there. He put rain on that guy's field so that his crops would go, could grow and he could eat them and he could continue to be alive, to bother you and to persecute you and to speak evil of you and to do all the things that his evil heart desires to do. God's causing him to live. He's part of God's creation. Okay? The rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Listen, if you're only going to be kind to those that are kind to you, you have no reward. That's easy. Anyone can do that. But if you get mad at every opportunity you have to get mad, you're very immature spiritually. You're not acting very Christ-like at all. All right, Matthew 18 now, and we'll, we'll take a look at this passage, and then we'll close. And so I'm going to start in verse 15, and uh, we'll take a look at the heading here, and it says, If your brother sins against you, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Now, you've got to understand this, right? Is that we've just read all these verses about how we're not supposed to be easily offended and we're supposed to be patient and tolerant and how we're supposed to view others and understand humanity and our fallen condition and how we're imperfect, and how we're supposed to confess our faults one to another, and pray for one another, and all these things which are the characteristics of Christ, right? We've just seen all that. So now, understanding all that, if your brother offends you, and it's something where you can't overlook it, right? It's, it's an offense that you determine to be so grave that you have to, you know, it's bothering you and it's eating you up. He says, go to him and talk to him, and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Who knows? Maybe he'll say, I'm sorry. I didn't, mean, I didn't mean to do that. How can I make it right? And then the issue is resolved and squashed and you no longer have a problem. Okay? But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, 
that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now, in this case, if, if you've got an issue with him uh, and, and you went to him about it and he doesn't hear you, well, now you, you go and you grab a couple other guys. Because under the Old Testament, it took two witnesses to affirm the law of God. So now we're going, we're getting these two witnesses. We're going to go and talk to the guy. Now, listen. If the grievance is unjust, if, if you're being, you know, if you're trying to hold this guy to a standard that's way up here and you're being petty and unforgiving and harsh and impatient and all these other things and you, you've got this wrath in your heart that really doesn't need to be there, I would hope that the two brothers would set you straight, right? That they'd say, listen, man, you know, we don't need to crucify this guy for this. You know, are you sure you're looking at it the right way? Do you understand the sovereignty of God and that everything does, everything that people do against you is all working for your good? You know, if someone takes the time to explain to the guy, you know, how that, uh, you know, God uses people to purify us and that we're not supposed to despise these fiery trials and persecution and everything else that we endure, maybe the guy will see it from a different light. But... If he doesn't, you bring these two guys. Now, that, that means that these two guys also have to be in agreement that the sin is real, right? That what the guy has done is merits some type of a consequence. So if you can find a couple guys that agree that the, the action merits uh, repentance, that it's something that's so serious that, you know, he needs to repent of because it will bring the judgment of God upon his life, uh, then go to him with, Two or three witnesses, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Well, that verse has actually caused some controversy because some people will look at it and say, well, tell it to the church. That means, you know, that everyone in the church should know about it. That would be the congregationalist viewpoint where you think that everyone in the church is like their own sovereign member and they all need to know everything that's going on. Other people will look at it as like, well, there's elders and rulers and leaders in the church and they represent the body as a whole. And every single member of the church, like the guy that comes once every four months, you know, they all don't need to be made aware of every single situation, like whether we're going to paint the sanctuary or whether we're going to buy new curtains or if we're going to put some flowers in. Not everyone needs to be aware of everything. So tell it unto the church. Well, who exactly is the church? Could it be the leadership in the church? Is it everyone in the church? You know, it's essentially saying go to the church. Bring the issue to the church. Now, if the, everyone in the church is in agreement, and we're talking about the leadership or whoever, however the church government is set up, if they're all in agreement that this guy has sinned, you know, then he may need to be put out, put out of the congregation. Right? He might need to. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Fornication is very serious. I mean, it'll condemn a man's soul. And such fornication, as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Oh my goodness. This man is sleeping with his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So they should rather have mourned that this man is caught in sin. It's not a hatred against him, it's a mourning that he's caught up in this sin and needs to be removed. For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And he goes on and says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So what he's saying is that this man needs to be removed from the fellowship because he's continuing in this unrepentant sin which God clearly condemns. He's sleeping with his father's wife. And, and when it's talking about when ye are gathered together, this is what we'll see again when we turn over to uh, Matthew 18. It's talking about 
being gathered together in judgment when we we as believers in a church have the authority to execute the judgment of God to say listen the Bible is our authority it says right here that fornication will condemn you the fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of God okay you cannot that's our standard and so we bring it to people and uh, so he's talking about removing this person and then he says right here in verse 9 I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators yet not all to get together with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters for then must ye needs go out of the world listen we can't get away of this all together because we're in the world and there's going to be sinful people in the world but in the church we can't tolerate a man sleeping with his father's wife but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is a brother that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one no not to eat so listen, if this man is living in constant, habitual, unrepentant sin, you need to separate yourself from him. And so this is what we're seeing over here again in, in, uh, in Matthew 18. Matthew 18. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So if there's a guy that's caught up in this sin, like the ones we just saw, drunkenness and, and extortion and fornication, and he's a railer just fighting with people and, you know, throwing blows and all this stuff, you know, and you, the church, it gets to the point where the people in the church say, yeah, we have an issue with this guy. We're going to have to talk to him. And he doesn't hear anyone and doesn't accept any responsibility, well, he's going to have to be removed. I hope you guys can see the distinction between the attitude that we're supposed to have on a daily basis and then the case of having a just totally disobedient brother that needs to be removed from the fellowship. I hope you got. It just takes wisdom. It takes wisdom. There's... You know, you, you have to be in the Word, you have to study it, and you have to grow to a point to where God changes your heart and gives you this, uh, His grace, fills you with grace, fills you with His Spirit, and, 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 and causes us to display the characteristics of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit. You know, when we're that way, we're forgiving and we're understanding and we're compassionate. We have all these things, and, and, but at the same time, we can execute the Word of God. And then it says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So this is talking about judgment. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So this is talking gathered in my name. It's talking about in judgment, in this type of situation of discipline in the church when someone's in sin and we're showing them from the word of God, look, this is what it says. This is forbidden in heaven and earth, okay? Or this is allowed. That's what binding and loosing means, to forbid and to allow. And we judge according to the word of God. So when, when there's brothers in an assembly, in a church that's in agreement and an issue, God is with them as long as they're using the word of God. Um, man, I love this next passage. After he says all that, about how go to your brother and if he doesn't hear you get take two or three witnesses and go to him and if he still doesn't hear you you know bring him before the church and then he goes on and talks about a parable of the unforgiving servant okay because we're not supposed to have this um attitude this uh just you know standard of perfection that no one can live up to where we condemn everyone that's why he goes on and tells the parable of the unforgiving servant says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? 
you got to understand is that in the Jewish culture, uh, they said that you should forgive a man up to three times. And they'll cite Amos, I think it's chapter 3, verses 1 through, I'm going to say like 13. Well, the whole chapter, but particularly like the first couple verses. Uh, talk about a, forgiving a man three times. Okay, so the Jewish rabbis would say, you forgive a man three times, and then on the fourth, you know what? You don't, you don't have to forgive him anymore. That was the teaching of the Jews in this culture at the time of Christ. And so Peter's more than doubling it. He comes along and says, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times but until 70 times seven. <laughs> He's saying, listen, you better be a pretty forgiving guy. You better put that anger out of your heart and have already forgiven him for his wrong because when he turns, right, if your brother repent, repent, metanoia, turn and think differently. If he turns and thinks differently, forgive him. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. That's like millions of dollars for us. That's how much he owed. So this guy here, this is talking about a certain king, and he's taking account of his servants. This servant had embezzled millions of dollars of the king's money. I want you to get that. When it says thousands of talents, he embezzled millions. Okay? But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. And the servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. So now this is a much smaller debt. And now we're talking a hundred pence. I'm not sure what pence is. It's not millions of dollars like this guy embezzled. It's probably like a hundred bucks. Okay. Owes him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. He's strangling, he's choking this guy by the throat. He said, Give me my money. Pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant, oh, where am I? And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. So now they go back to the king. This guy had embezzled millions of dollars from the king and now he's strangling one of his servants and give me my hundred bucks. And on watch, the guys that are on looking, they, they go back and tell the king, that guy that you just forgave for the extortion of millions of dollars, he just choked out one of his servants for a hundred bucks. And so the king's like, get that guy back over here. I want to talk to him. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So now this guy's going to torture until he pays millions of dollars that he stole. Well, how are you going to do that when you're getting tortured all day long? It's going to be hard. So likewise, shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. The teaching of this parable is that God is that certain king. We're that, that servant that has this enormous sin debt. 
I, I deserve to be thrown in hell for everything I've done. And I mean, I've lived a life as the most vile sinner that you, that you could be. I don't say that with any pride at all. I say that with shame. Before I came to Christ, I had to fall to the depths of despair. And just a great sinner. But all that was forgiven. And I was given new life in Christ. And now I'm going to get mad at this guy that has made us committed a smaller offense against me? Do you see this parable of the unforgiving servant? This shows how we're supposed to react, how we're supposed to interact with our brothers and sisters in Christ and with the world around us. The word forgiveness in the New Testament Greek is ephesus. And it actually means to pardon and release from prison. But the thing is this, when you're holding a grudge and when you're harboring resentment in your heart towards other people, when you refuse to forgive them and you become angry and hateful and resentful, you're the one that's in the prison. So when you forgive the person, you're letting them out of a prison, but really, you're doing yourself a favor. You're accepting the will of God, and you're releasing yourself from the bondage to that anger, and malice, and wrath, and rage, and resentment, and everything else. We'll stop here. Father, we do thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, to judge righteous judgment, not hypocritical. Help us, Lord, to be forgiving. Help us to demonstrate the characteristics of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit to the world around us. You're so good to us, Lord, and gracious and merciful. Help us to show the world around us that God is good and worthy of praise and that we truly do have Riches in Christ, an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled, reserved in heaven for us and doesn't fade away. Forgive us, Father, for our sins. We know that we're not perfect. We fail you daily. Help us to do better. Cause repentance in us. Put a desire for your word in our hearts. and Help us, Father, to be uh, faithful in, in prayer and in our daily study. And help us, Lord, to live for others and, and to live for you and your spiritual kingdom and not the things of this temporal world. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.